Okay. So good evening. We're going to start with a little bit of an interactive exercise to break the ice, everyone. All right. So I'm going to show some games, and if I'm going to just shout out what these games are called, I would appreciate it. The first uh, one up on the board. Chess. 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 Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. We're going to get we're going to get a little more tricky. All right. Next one. Does anyone know what this game is? Duels of the Planeswalkers. All right, next on the list. Starcraft. Oops. <laughs> very good, very good. Starcraft. All right, I want you to know this one. Our stone. Excellent. And this guy right here is the real challenging one. XCOM. All right, very impressed. Very impressed. All right, so this is Creating Artificial Intelligence for Games. My name is Ross Shabilsky. I am the founder and CEO of D20 Studios. It is a local indie game studio here based in Salt Lake City. This is uh, my second time having the pleasure to speak for the Salt Lake City IGA group. Last time I was here back in January, I was working for Electronic Arts as a producer, developing AAA mobile games at our site downtown on State Street. And since that time, I've made the tradition transition down to full-time indie, and I'm very excited to be here to share with you on a topic uh, that is very near and dear to my heart, making artificial intelligence. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, how did these images make you feel about what you saw and your potential ability to create something as vicious as the AI in those games? Anybody, just go ahead and shout out some words. Envious. Envious? Well, that's a good one. I should have not the envious. Okay, good. Intimidated. Intimidated. That was the one I was looking for. Yes. Anybody else? Excited. Excited. Ooh, that's a good one, too. Awesome. All right. So I had, let's see, mystified, overwhelmed, impossible. These are, these are the emotions that summarize how I felt when I first uh, saw these games and considered the challenge of undertaking and developing something like that. So, rest assured, it's all smoke and mirrors. Whoa, blow your mind. And what I want you to think about today is that I'm going to be that magician that all the other magicians hate, the one that goes and spills all the beans and the secrets about the magic tricks that takes away the illusion factor of what's so great. Everyone's always mystified by engineering what engineers can do because, you know, Nobody understands the tech, they don't understand all the things that go into it, they see the finished product, they don't understand all the underlying things that go together, and really it's not that, that complicated. We're going to break it down, I'm going to show you just how delusion works, and hopefully get you guys inspired to create some AI of your own. So what I'm going to do in this talk is first demystify it by unpacking the problem of artificial intelligence to a very simple set of rules and principles, and then I'm going to provide a framework for thinking about it um, in a way that allows you to see and tackle the challenges on your own as you build the AI for your games. And finally, I'm going to share some examples of techniques I've used to solve real AI problems I've encountered myself developing strategic um, tactical strategy games. All right, so this is an image of what I want to do with my next game. I'm trying to combine the tactical strategy elements of chess with the collectible card game playing mechanics of a Hearthstone. So imagine playing chess while also throwing cards on the table like a Hearthstone. So I took the two most complicated things that were hard enough on their own and now I'm going to put them together and make an AI that can play that, but not just play it. Um, you see, card games like that have 300, 400 plus cards in a launch set for a game like Hearthstone. Um, chess has only you know, a handful of different pieces. And the first time I did AI, uh, for the first game I developed, I had maybe 40 different abilities I had to consider. I did a lot of hand coding and very careful thought processes, custom made for each of those things. But looking forward to the future, if I'm going to make something that's 400 plus cards, I simply can't do manual programming. So the AI needs to be very robust. It needs to be able to self learn. It needs to be able to take any kind of element I could throw at it and know how to use it like a player would and create a compelling experience for the player. So that's what we're going to talk about today, how we do this. All right, so first unpacking the problem. Uh, AI seems complex, 
but it really does three very simple things. It takes a list and identifies all the possible actions that a player or that the AI player could do. It then prioritizes those choices. And then it takes and executes its decision based on the top prioritized action. And that's all the AI does. Now, with this one bit of tip alone, you can go home right now and create a very simple AI I like to call the zombie AI. The very first AI that, that you build getting started with. So a zombie AI is really straightforward. You take a list of all the moves you can you know, possibly do in your game. So if you have a game like Go or Chess, you collate the list of choices. This should be fairly straightforward if you've developed the game before, because in order for a human player to play the game, you have to have a list of control mechanics that they can use. So you take that list and you feed it into an array. And then the really hard part is you shuffle that list. And once you shuffle the list, you've got a list of random things that you can do, and you just have the AI pick the top one off the stack until there's no legal moves left. And you will have an AI that plays absolutely horribly, but may surprise you. Uh, the very first time I took this um, with the game and put it into action, it was a very creepy and surreal experience. It was like seeing Maybe how Dr. Frankenstein says <laughs> something, some abomination come to life. Um, you get things that sometimes are great moves and sometimes are absolutely atrocious, but it's, it's always interesting. Um, but that first step is sort of what gives you the motivation to really feel compelled and excited to see the computer doing something on its own. And then you start to dig into the problems of how to then unpack it further and develop more to it. So, I'm going to go back to our, our three central functions here. So, I crossed out the first two or sorry, the first one and the third one, really um, identify actions is not an AI function. It's a function of the game mechanics and controls. Uh, the player, in addition to the AI, has to understand what actions are available. And if you're developing controls, you already need to do that. So it's not really an essential part of the AI per se. Uh, likewise, executing the decision comes down to um, taking those choices and actually having it carry out what's going to happen when that choice is made, which also has to pre-exist if you have human players experience in your game. So really, AI development really comes down to number two, which is how to prioritize choices. So that's the very first major problem we're going to tackle. So this comes down to philosophy, my other very favorite subject. Um, we're going to ponder, <laughs> what is value? Anyone want to take a stab at what it means for something to have value? Oh, I'm just tantalized. Yes, Stacy. Is it going to be effective? Is it going to be effective? Yeah, what it comes down to. Right? Is it going to be effective? I like that. Yes? Uh, what are the rules and parameters of a system, and how can, and how well does an action uh, go to one end of the spectrum of, did it have a positive or a negative action depending on the relative? Good. No, that's good. All right, so does it, is it effective? Does it have a positive or negative impact? Anyone else want to take any other stabs at it? There's like the dictionary definition, I think, is something like uh, how, much it, how much something is desired or desirable. Yeah, I was going to say gratification. Gratification, desire, excellent. Those are all the parts that I feel captures what it means to have value. And it's, it's a weird thing. Um, when you start to develop AI, it brings this connection back to your own personal psyche. You have to ask questions like this as you're developing it to really understand the motivations of why the AI would do something. You get, you get into the heads of what your player is going through, but on a level that's far deeper than you might have previously imagined before. So yes, all excellent answers on the notion of value. So the next part is, how do we take that value and put it into a context that can be valid for the game? How do we get the computer to understand? So, this is what I call, um, we're going to streamline the value um, based on the objective. And what the AI desires is the game objective that you're assigning as a player of that game. So, in the case of the game I'm developing, the AI's objective is to defeat the human player. And they do so by killing off all the human player's heroes. The heroes die when they lose all of their life points. And the actions that reduce current life are therefore valuable and desired by the AI. So we're speaking to that motivation again. Um, now there's some supporting actions here we can derive based on what we know about how valuable life points are. 
Um, for example, increasing the AI's attack power yields higher potential for it to do more damage. It becomes more effective, as we had said earlier. Decreasing the opponent's attack power likewise lets the AI live longer. So another thing the AI desires is I want to be on the board longer because if I'm here, I can continue pummeling you. And increasing my life lets me live longer. Also, longevity allow me to be more effective, be there to beat the player. Question, yes? Does your game have the uh, concept of a king in that you can win the game by killing a certain It does. We're experimenting with that mechanic right now. But uh, yes, there is. there are pieces that are considered to be more valuable than others based on their ability to have more powerful actions. So yes, that's another excellent factor. OK. So next piece is we have to put it into terms the computer can understand. Computers, uh, sadly, don't relate to us, and they don't understand philosophy and desire in the same way we do. Computers understand numbers. <laughs> so the key is, how do I take value desire and put it into a number that the, the AI can recognize as value? So this is a simple example of how I'm doing it in the game I'm building right now. I mentioned there were those life or production of the opponent's life is the key measure of victory. And there's four ways we looked at how it does. Um, the AI's power, ability to do damage. The AI's life points, which determines whether it fails or dies. The player's power, the player's life. So the first thing that happens is prior to executing any game action, the AI is going to store a game state that records the total value of all these pieces. So it looks at all the units on the board, all the characters it has, all the pieces, counts up their life totals, puts it in that value, takes its life values, puts it in that value. After it's done that, it's going to execute whatever the action is it wants to do. So if its action is, I want to try attacking something. I want to know if this attack is a good thing to do. It's going to go ahead and do that action. And then it's going to calculate the diff or the difference in totals before and after it did the action. And that's going to come up with the score. And the score is going to be the difference in its power plus the difference in its life, subtracting out the opponent's power and the opponent's life. And that will give it a value to that action. So a really simple way to think about it is if, if I cast a fireball spell on somebody and blast in pieces, and that fireball does five damage to one of its characters, the AI awards that a score value of five points. Likewise, if I were to cast a healing spell as an AI player, that healed one of my characters three life, I would consider that to be three points. And that's how it's going to use one method of prioritizing its actions. All right, so to know without doing, I mentioned AI has to sort of test these things. To know without doing, we, we simulate. And like these astronauts here on this strange, obscure Hawaiian island we call Mars. <laughs> they are practicing for the real mission by simulating what it is they're about to go and do. And likewise, we're going to need to do that with our AI. So the most effective programmatic tool for simulation is a design pattern known as the command pattern. All right, so I'm going to read the formal definition of the command pattern. It is a behavioral design pattern in which an object is used to encapsulate all information needed to perform an action or trigger an event as at a later time. Sounds very confusing. I looked at that and I'm like, that is a very stale interpretation of what this awesome thing was. So I had to couple it with this guy in the tank because it just makes it feel more visceral, right? <laughs> All right, so I don't know how many engineers we have now. So engineers, raise your hands. That's pretty good. About half the audience here. That's excellent. All right, so this is for you, and most of you guys are probably veterans, and this is all really basic stuff, but I'm trying to keep it, you know, pretty high level so that the non-programmers can follow along. This is an example class that defines what the command pattern does. It consists of the following three parts. Construct. So this particular command is going to be about damaging stuff. In the past, two things. The victim I am attempting to obliterate, and a damage value of how much punch I'm going to give them. It's going to assign those and store those in the class, and then it's going to call, have a method called execute, where it subtracts from the victim's life the damage dealt. And that's going to have another method here called the undo, where it's the exact opposite thing. So instead of subtracting the damage, it's going to add it back. That example was unclear. I'm going to make everyone hungry now. <laughs> 
We're gonna, we're gonna make it a pancake, right? So there you go, the stack of flat tops. I, I thought this was so appropriate. So picture that each pancake in the stack of flapjacks is a command, all right? And whenever you do something with the AI, you're gonna wrap it in a pancake, you can quote this way, <laughs> add it to the stack of pancakes, and then you're gonna call the execute method on that pancake to do the thing you want. And whenever you undo something, you're gonna take one of the pancakes off, you're gonna eat it because it's delicious, and then you're gonna call the undo method. And that's how the AI is gonna simulate things in your game. Tastiest analogy I've heard all day. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions so far? I see someone looks confused back there. <laughs> oh, so yeah, this is a pretty bad projector. We should. Uh, I hope it's going to turn out okay and everything for putting the video. But yeah, I will send a slide deck if uh, if that would help. All right. Um, okay. So now we're going to dive into some use case examples, real world examples of how to apply this within a game. We're going to start with a really simple strategy. This is the strategy I like to call game up. Right. So in a lot of strategy games, you play the uh, XCOM or StarCraft or the chess or anything like that, there's this notion that you want to gain up on a single target to eliminate. The value as a player in doing so is that if you can focus fire and eliminate the target, you've removed a very valuable piece that could be punching you back the next turn. So it's better to focus fire, kill off a piece, than it is to spread damage across the herd because that allows um, better opportunities for the AI to have less things attacking you on its next turn. So here's an example of a poor strategy. I've got two Minotaurs here that the AI can attack, and they decided to go ahead and just divide attacks between the two of them. Very nice. But uh, in the good strategy, they decide, you know, what if we all work together and beat up this guy, we could pretty much kill him, get rid of him, and then we've only got to worry about seven damage coming on his next turn instead of four. All right, so how can we use the methods I've just referred to to implement this within the engine? All right, so how to game up an enemy? We're gonna go through those three steps again. First, we're gonna identify the possible action. So, as I said, if you've built the game already, you've got a control system in place, we have to have a way for the player to select its units and make attacks. So the very first thing we're gonna do from the AI side, just go ahead and identify all the possible attack actions that the AI's team could do. I want to collate that list. I want to cross-reference it with the possible targets. So what that means is if I've got three characters and they each get an attack, it's going to derive for each character its potential moves, where it can move to, and which units it could attack. And that's going to make a list from that of the possible actions. So there would be three actions, the three attacks, and then a list of the possible targets. In this case, there would be the two minutes. Then it's going to go and simulate using the pancake stack um, for each of those targets, and it's going to store the resulting score that generated for each target. So for each of those targets, it's going to say target one, Minotaur A, who can attack it? A, B, and C can attack it. A and B can attack it. It's going to track for each one how much damage those units could deal to that Minotaur. And that's going to execute the highest score in action. What you see happen with this is a pattern developed for the AI, where the more units that can attack a target victim, the higher the score will be. Right? And that's because if there's three guys in range to attack the Minotaur, it's going to add the, the damage value for all three of those guys. So it's going to have a much higher total than a guy who might be off to the side, and the guy off to the side might only get two guys attacked, so his score is going to be lower. So what that's going to do is create a prioritization value that will allow the AI to differentiate a better decision of going with the guy on the left because all three characters can attack him as opposed to the one on the right, only two can attack him. If the unit would result in being defeated, so if they had enough uh, power to kill him during that simulation, it would come back with an even higher score because now you're talking about not only is there a higher um, damage uh, result, but removal of that unit is also going to give you a higher benefit because you've taken the power away from the player, which all goes back to that original score we talked about. So you put that in the equation as a as bonus points. Uh, if a uh, character dies, that's bonus points for the equation. It's it's already in the equation. So when we calculate um, score, right? When we use the term score, score. There's a right here. Remember, score is the combination of those four factors, which were um, AI power, 
AI life, um, player power, and player life. Okay. So by default, with that scoring mechanism in place, since it's tracking the game state changes for each one of those things, it's going to have that already built into the equation as well as one score. Um, the gang up technique is a very simple method that's going to result in a much stronger AI off the bat from the random zombie AI. Yes? So with multiple targets, um, loop through the check um, for each individual target, or would you rather be trying to find the total? Like, would you loop for each individual like, target that you can hit with the equation, or would you do that loop once? It's, so it, it's actually a double loop. You're gonna do it, you're, you can do it either way. You can, you, you can loop through target, and then for each target, you loop through all three of the actions, okay. or you can start with the actions, and then for each action, loop through all the targets. Okay. Either way, it gives you the same results. Yes. Now, in a real-time game like StarCraft, you're not going to do this every single frame. Do you do it when an enemy is spawned, or do you have a specific time set aside to actually make these decisions? Excellent question. I have never made it for a real-time game, so I can't answer that specifically. But I would be willing to wager that for something like a StarCraft, they're processing things on the model side, not on the animation side. So it's going to be probably doing calculations based on group clusters and territories. So there'd be like an arc radius where it's probably doing something similar to this on a smaller scale base relative to the target area space where the battle is occurring. And it's going to be combining that AI process with other competing things like its resource management and those other things like that. So I can't give you a specific answer, unfortunately, but it would be of a similar base principle as a, as a turn-based strategy. Right? Yes? Is this the strongest possible AI so far? Like, is this, is, is this going to be the hardest AI to fight right now? No, no. We're, we're starting with something simple. We're building up to the really hard cases. Mm -hmm. I want to give something sort of like a, a, an, a, a contextual example to sort of showcase that these, these techniques all sort of build up to a more complex as we go on. The, the way that I found effective approaching um, development, and I should give this backstory. Um, when I was in college, my, the, the course I was the most excited about taking science was AI. Yeah. I finally got to my sophomore, junior year, I forget which one it was. I got into class and I dropped out after three classes. It was just way over my head, too complex. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that had to do with, um, one, I was doing a ton of other stuff at the time, hard to focus, writing in a language I didn't know very well. And it just didn't, I didn't have the right contextual examples, the right framework of thinking about. It, it, we were starting with coding examples before I understood like, how to even dissect or take apart the problem. When I approached it for making the first game and I was trying to come across these problems, um, I started with really simple wins first and then kind of used those to snowball into the more complex things. Um, and just for the record on that too, the, the first game's AI, I should have had this all in the precursor, but I figured I'd just give a new one. Um, the, the feedback I got on the AI and Hero Mages, the first game I developed, was this AI is brutal. It is vicious. I can't get past the first level. It is skewing on the level of difficulty that's near impossible. Like it was, it was too hard. Right. Well, we'll talk about that too because that's another thing you don't want to do. Is your your objective is not to make the perfect AI because if you do that, you're going to isolate a lot of people. Um, just up there, so I thought that. Yes. I was just curious about how you would build in if it was a multi-move to play. Like, okay. I want to get rid of, like, I will sacrifice my pawn in this move. Right. I mean, this doesn't really build that in for multi-move. Well, I think it's a strategy of moves, of mm -hmm. thinking moves ahead. Yeah. Yeah, this, this, this method is, is, um, is a tactical method. So it's looking at a list of possible choices, and it's a simple way of vetting out how to build upon that starting point of completely random, right, mm -hmm. zombie AI to something that's one step more intelligent. So I might just be talking about step two or three. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we'll get there. We're going to get okay. to more complex things. Cool. I promise. I promise. It gets harder. I'm glad that this one was easy and that everyone is like an expert and, and, and is blowing past. That makes me very <laughs> thrilled. <laughs> so it's just telling me I need to step up the game here. All right. So now we're going to talk about positions. This is another fairly simple one. Um, but this speaks to the problem of how to get AI to position itself for maximum opportunity. Right? All right, so we've got happy red barbarian here in the corner who finds himself amongst his enemies. A smart AI is going to take advantage by attacking the third thing he's got. There's another guy down here that has room for this reach up. But he's right there now. So this iron golem is going to move up and punch him in the face, 
And Calvin wants to attack, but oh wait, I'm blocked because he's in my way. I can't attack him now. So that's a fail state, bad use of AI optimization. Let's try it again. This time, Iron Golem smartly decides to go over here. Why? Because he wants to get his buddy Paladin in there to get the shot as well. So everybody can attack. Success. Alright. We'll demonstrate how we accomplish that. Alright. So again, same three-step method. It starts off identical to the first one. So we're just going to identify those actions, collate the list. Except this time we go through the loop. We're going to determine um, something called the conflict. The conflict is going to be just a number that we increment every time that the AI would enter a position. All right? So it's just another way of detecting collisions. Every time an action would go into a space, plus one. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sort the actions for the AI, this time using two parameters. We're going to sort by the action that the highest score. Remember, score is just this other piece we're building on here, which is the four categories. How much damage is going to deal? in terms of the game state. And then we're going to factor in position conflicts. And this time we're going to use the lowest position conflicts as the optimum op choice. And then we're going to execute high scoring action. Okay? Doing this method alone will get the AI in a majority of situations to pick the optimum position. Um, just by eliminating the uh, notion of conflicts. When the AI chooses movement places that have the least conflicts, it means you have a less chance that other units are going to interrupt the movement path of the allies, and then more units will naturally get to attack. Again, this is another simple method of framing that step and building one more layer of complexity. So we started with an AI that was raw brains. It got a little smarter and decided to start focusing on one brain first at a time, and now it's going to take and optimize its position um, by letting everybody get into the brains. All right, so. We're actually pretty far along here. Um, specific techniques we've covered two, gang up, optimization of position. Uh, the next three we're going to cover is progressively harder. So I'm going to teach you how to derive potential value from a support ability. This is something like a, a buff to a character that's a little bit more abstract and harder to distinguish a value for. Then we're going to get to the really fun stuff, which is deriving value from non-numerical abilities. So this is something where um, a card or ability in your game might do something that's not directly measurable in terms of a number. Like, you move a piece to a different position. Or you put an obstacle in the opponent's way. And how's it going to sign like that? And then lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about how to determine the proper order to use available actions for the game. Alright, so p potential value is another fun philosophical topic. Um, I came up with this really cryptic quote that sounded cool, <laughs> so I'll go ahead and read it. That which enables or diminishes our ability to gain value is itself a value that can be measured. <laughs> it's deep, right? It's deep. All right. So just remember that roller coaster there and think about this from high school physics. All right, now we're talking about the conundrum of potential value and how it relates to the game. So I'm going to give a, I'm gonna give a real example of, of how this would be applied. So, um, a buff ability that you might see in a game like a Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone would be like an enchantment that says, attack plus two on this character until end of turn. It's a great example. Now, the, the next key part is we're moved at end of turn. And that's important because when we go into our scoring here, right, we did say that power increase was something we could numerically address, right? But the problem is if it's removed at the end of turn, then it doesn't really add any value to the AI because it's gone. At the end of the turn, it didn't really change its score state at all. It changed the immediate need of getting plus two power, but that plus two power never actualized, it never realized its potential. So it's worthless. But we, we so don't want, well, for example, you would not want, it, let me put you in a scenario. If you've got, uh, come over here, if you've got your, t the AI's team is down here, right, and the opponent's team is right here, okay, and I have a buff spell that can give him plus two attack, awesome. But the farthest he can move is right here. He can't reach his target. At the end of the turn, plus two is going to go away, and now I just lost that card that could have been valuable in a future turn. That would be a very poor AI decision to cast a buff that can never be actualized in an attack where it gets plus two damage. Okay? So, how do we determine whether or not the buff has value at all? Go to Great Scott! 
We're going to travel back to the future. How many people have seen Back to the Future? Please say everybody. <laughs> okay. I, I, I just want to make sure. All right, so we're going to talk a little about Back to the Future timelines. And I, I bet not one of you thought for a minute you would be seeing this up on the board and then talk about AI. But I'm going to explain how this is related. Right? So in Back to the Future, right, it's 1985. You get this base timeline where Marty, Marty is basically getting yelled at by this bald guy here. And uh, he's got a few choices he makes. Right? He's going to travel back to 1955. He fixes his parents' relationship. And then he ends up with Jennifer plus the sweet ride. Right? He also goes back to 2015, stupidly leaves the hominid for Biff to steal. And then Biff kills his dad. It's a pretty crappy future. Right? Not too fun. But what's important here is that we've got this notion of a base timeline. So, how many of you, having seen this, would go for the 1955 choice? And how many people want to go back and let your dad get killed? <laughs> Not too many, right? All right, so what I'm trying to present here is a notion that we need to give the AI a context for which you can understand the value of what this buff can do for it. It's going to peek into the future and look at its potential possible futures by comparing them to its baseline future, okay? So, we need a baseline timeline to measure the potential, all right? So what we're gonna do is first run a simulation, but this time it's not gonna be just of a single action. We're gonna simulate an entire term. We're gonna call that, uh, sorry, without the buff ability. We're gonna call this the ideal term. Let me give an example of what that looks like. The AI starts off with three characters, and not considering any of its spells or other wacky outlandish abilities, it can move and attack with those units. So the very first thing it's going to do is just go ahead and do a basic simulation of what it might look like to just move those units and go attack stuff. And for that entire turn, it's going to record that as the base timeline or the ideal turn. Right. Then it's going to undo that, go back and apply the buff, and rerun the simulation. This time, if we're over here, and we run that simulation with the buff, this score is going to drop to zero, because there's no change in its future, right? He started off with three guys that could not reach an attack range. All these three guys can do is move up, and they can't score anything. They can just get closer. So they can score points, maybe the potential of getting closer again, which we'll talk about later. But it doesn't actually get to attack. Now, if we had an alternate future where, say, instead of starting here, this guy was close in range, and he could attack, now the score would be, let's, let's say his default value was 3, right? So you could attack this guy and get 3 points for killing 3 points out of that guy. With the buff, he would get an additional 2. He would deal 5 damage and his score would be 5. So the value of that buff spell is now 2. Baseline feature was a 3, but now he's got a plus 2 for Jennifer and the sweet guy. If it does not have any value, you just put a flag in there to Hold that car for a future turn. Great Scott. Everyone's mind's blown so far? <laughs> okay. All right, we're gonna move on. All right, so now we're gonna talk about non numerical ability potential. So consider cards like the following. We've got a barricade card, right? What this does is it creates a wall on the board that blocks movement, okay? I've got a card called Gravity Well that pulls enemies toward a space. I got another card called Teleport that just moves you to a new location in the world. All right, so the buff had a value that directly contributed to our score factor, right? So we knew how to measure it, because it could, at least once we had a time to detect, oh yeah, power, that's something I can measure, right? But how do you assign a value to an abstraction like a position change? Anyone want to take a stab at that middle structure? Does, is it related to what it enables on the next turn? Good, close. Next turn, all right. So, I mean, like, like if it puts me in a position uh, to have a better score next turn, then that is a better possibility. How do you know if it has a better position for next turn? You have to run the simulation on that next turn as well. Next turn as well, good, good. Josh, you want to add something? So I have a feeling you're going to use that uh, number of conflicts measurement to get it. I'm trying to think that does come in there. It might come in there. I can't recall now. Yes. Number of conflicts. Next week, your turn. Good answers. Good answers. Anybody else? 
Yes. Could make a whole other list of all possible positions that could involve movement. Okay. And then use that to factor like two or three turns a Two or three turns a Okay, good. Excellent answers. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So, next turn. You guys are thinking right. We're going back to the future. <laughs> Again. All right. So, I'm going to pose another weird question for you. And then the question is, was the time travel that Marty made in 2015 actually a good thing? All right. So everyone said they weren't going to make that choice the first time around because the sweet ride and jump is pretty good. But if you recall, when you take and jump to the next turn, right? So here's where you left the almanac, Buff, but Biff kills your dad, right? But then it goes back to 1955, stops Biff again, learns less of humility back in the Wild West, <laughs> then comes back to Neo 1985, and now he's got an even better future, the one where he didn't get an accident that broke his leg and got him fired in the far further future. So, very good, Ellis, the answer is, we look to the far further, further future to find the answer here. All right, so abstract values actually require a minimum of two simulations. You can get really, really wild with this going forward, but um, we're gonna start here with our base timeline, okay? So this is the base timeline where the AI does not use teleport. If we simply do the first turn and use teleport, there's no change, right? And so here, this is similar to the way. The AI is trapped over here in the corner. He's surrounded by his enemies. He's got only one health left. Pretty much a sneeze will kill him at this point. He's trapped there, right? If he doesn't use teleport, the AI is going to slaughter him, and he dies, right? So that teleport um, has got to have some value right now. Opponent turn with, once we ride this out, after we fact the teleport, so long, suckers! He's now over here. He's out of range of everyone's attack. So if he lives to fight another day, suddenly the teleport that had no value at the end of the first turn, after two turn simulations, is now invalid, plus a thousand points, because the AI either loses the game or gets to continue playing. So it's an immeasurable amount of points. The way I would score something like this is, uh, I think I'd really just use plus a thousand points. Further, further future timelines. Any questions on that one? All right, we'll continue on. Dun, 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 dun. All right, so just to wrap up the key takeaways here. Um, first, establish the ideal AI turn. So we talked about that in the last one, right? The ideal turn assumes the AI just moves and attacks with three base units in this particular example. Now we're going to establish an ideal turn for the opponent. So after we go ahead and do a little magic where the AI moves its three guys up, right? We're going to assume that the opponent, being a reasonable human player, the AI thinks, well, I guess he's probably very smart with his guys up and try to attack me as well. Right? Or in this case, I'm boxed in the corner, so he's probably going to go ahead and punch me with everything he's got to kill me. And then we're going to run both those simulations. We're going to store that as a score called the score after two simulations. Then we're going to undo all that stuff using the pancake method. Then we're going to use our set ability, teleport, and rerun them. Uh, in the rerun simulation, the AI, no, or the opponent rather, no longer has legal moves to attack. So it undoes its potential future where it kills it and changes the timeline to one more fatal for the AI. And so the score potential, the numerical value assigned to the um, non numerical abilities is the difference of score for two sims before and after using the ability. And that's using just two turns as a depth. So you could absolutely go three, four turns in. The further, further, further future you go in with your AI, the smarter and smarter and smarter you become. And that's why chess algorithms on supercomputers cannot be beaten. <laughs> because they have thousands of turns in the future that go beyond what a human brain can comprehend. So that's that. All right. Now, Feeling really good here. You guys have learned a lot. We've covered up the game, optimized targets, potential value for supports, and non numerical abstract abilities. So now, the most difficult problem of all. How do we determine the proper order to use available actions? All right, so, order matters. We can now determine an ability like a buff has a potential score of X, and that's awesome. But, wait, how does the AI actually know it's supposed to use the buff before it right? We said the buff has a potential value of two because it can deal an extra two damage, but in order for that to happen, the AI has to be smart enough to play the buff 
before tax. So how does the AI make the decision? That's what we need to do next. All right. So, testing permutations. All right. How many math people out there? <laughs> math nerds. All right, a couple, three. All right, good. Anyone want to take a guess at uh, what I mean by testing permutations? What do you think we're going to do? Score the order? different possible orders. Score the different possible orders. Excellent. Simulate, simulation plus, plus the list of possible orders equals Eureka! We've solved it! We're all AI geniuses now, right? Wrong! You're all wrong! Why are we wrong? Do the math majors know why we're wrong? Give me, give me some hints. Alright, so consider this. If we have five units, we're going to assume we just have five units. So the AI started with three, maybe he gained a couple more along the way. Each of those five units have two things they can do. They can move and attack. Do some math here. All right, we've got five spell cards we can play. So that's a total of five times two, 10 plus five, 15 actions. All right, now we want to figure out how many unique orders there are for 15. All right, so I'm going to go back to like high school algebra here. Arrange n items chosen k at a time. Anyone know what number that might generate? 15, choose 15. We're talking about over a trillion possible permutations. There is not a computer on the planet that's going to help you <laughs> in this scenario. And it only gets worse because that's just a small subset. Imagine trying to look further, further futures. You can't even look one future ahead with that many combinations. How the heck are you going to get the processing power to come up with the further, further future? This is a major problem. This, is, this of all the different problems is probably the one that I've struggled with the most to figure out how the heck to do this. So I'm going to share a few tips I've encountered, <laughs> hopefully safe. Save you all some of this. All right, so the, the key thing here is brute force simulations will not work. There is simply not enough processing power. And if processing power is your only factor, then memory will be, because you've got to store all that data somewhere, and a trillion calculations comes with a trillion sets of data. So you just simply can't do that. So what we need to do is get really smart about how we sort through those permutations. So we're going to start with the easiest first and work our way up. All right, so easiest method is simply it's going to sound really stupid, but <laughs> limit the permutations. <laughs> so n choose 15 possibilities, reduce the number to say a lower number. So instead of choosing all 15, we're going to say two. Okay? If we choose 15, that means we're going to choose two possible unique orders out of that 15. That already reduces our possible combinations down from about a trillion plus to 210. Much more sizable number. Now, of course, you're going to ask, well, aren't you missing a ton of opportunities if you go down to two? Yes, you are. Your AI will not be super, super smart genius, but will it be smart enough to kick a basic player's ass? 210 possibilities? Probably. That's the sweet spot. Yes? I was just going to say, if you use some fuzzy logic and try to decide which one to do, it also adds random ability to the AI, which makes it feel more real, even though it's totally fair. You're totally stealing my thing. But yes, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay. All right, so we're going to start to get into some of that fun stuff. All right, number two, medium. We're going to divide actions into logical groups and then sort the subsets. I think this is a little bit kind of moving toward what you're talking about here. So then we're going to combine. All right, so here's some examples, right? Uh, instead of testing it from a set of 15 choose 15, we're going to break it up into really small subsets and then test permutation counts within the smaller subsets. So the first easy one might be we'll combine the move and attack into a single action. Right, so we'll assume that the AI doesn't move without attacking for purposes of this example. All right, that brings down to three actions. And in this case, we'll go ahead and test all three. So three choose three gives us six possible permutations. Basically what that's saying is, of the unit actions that I have available, of the three characters not assuming spells, what's the best order of attacking with my three guys, my three dudes? All right? And then separately, we're going to do another calculation. We're going to take our five spells. Now we're going to use our optimization of the first one. We're going to choose two. 5 choose 2 gives us 20 permutations for the spell. All right, and then we'll kind of flip-flop and say, is it better for me to cast spells first, then attack things with my units, or is it better for me to attack my units, and then use the spells, right? So that gives us two more permutations. So that goes from 6, 20, 28 possible permutations. Much smaller than a trillion. All right, now we get a little harder, because even that many permutations is still a lot to track. Designing a smart filter patterns based on knowledge of your game. Right? So this is where you've got to use specific insights about your unique game product or 
unique only to you, and then leverage that as a way to give the AI sort of a fighting edge. So what do I mean by that? I'll give another example in the context of the game I'm building. So teleport is an expensive spell because it's one that we showed requires a further, further future. We need two timelines to figure out if teleport even has value, right? To simulate it for each of the possible moves. If you could teleport to any space on a five by seven grid, you're doing that simulation now 35 times, right? That's a lot of expensive calculations to go and simulate a full turn 35 times, right? So how do we mitigate that? Um, well, instead of simulating it for all the spaces, we'd be smart about what we think teleport has value. So I looked at it and said, okay, well, how about instead of testing all of them, we're going to test only spaces based to enemies. I figure if the AI teleports next to an enemy, the value it gains is the potential to smack them in the face with attacks. Right? So that had to happen. Another option might be test spaces that are the furthest away from enemies. Because as we saw in the example, if you're far away from the enemies, you can be safe from counterattack. Right? So that's about it. Everything in between, waste of CPU time. Just cut it out. Save yourself tons and tons of processing. Alright, so, give me some notes on AI processing in general now. Um, my AI runtime on this project when I started <coughs> was somewhere in the ballpark of over 45 seconds. That is a horrible user experience to hit a button after 45 seconds for the screen to do nothing before you see the AI do something. My goal was to get the AI process that entire turn in less than a second. And I achieved that. Here's how I did it. Alright, so, optimizing AI process. Number one, break the permutation of subsets for testing, as I demonstrated earlier, was the first key thing that generated a huge, huge win. Number two, object pooling. This is an absolute must. So, if you're running simulations in your game, the absolute most expensive operation you're going to run, calculating those simulations and then doing them, is creation of objects. Uh, particularly if there are things that are complex or custom data structures you made, like a character, and say that character maybe has special abilities, and say those special abilities have listeners that trigger other abilities. It gets to become a very expensive operation for the computer to recreate and then dispose of all that stuff thousands and thousands and thousands of times per second. So, you want to use an object pool. Um, if I say that term, is that familiar to everyone? Does everyone know what an object pool means? I'll kind of summarize it. The, the idea is you want to recycle stuff. Instead of creating and destroying, you want to store references to objects you've already created, and when you no longer need them, you put them on the back burner in a list somewhere, and then come back and use them. Another term that I've heard for that is factory. Um, factory, you yes. Create a factory mm -hmm. to create those objects and then store them when you're not using them. Absolutely, yes. Very effective design for that. So, object pooling, factories, absolute must. That will save you time. I think. After the permutation thing, this is probably number two that gave me the most time back in terms of processing this project. Right? Object pool, everything in the game. All right, number three, tree data structure. So when you start looking at further, further futures into the thing, you need a way to track that data so you don't have to recalculate it. So similar to how I would read object pool or you know, conserve resources or recycle the objects I'm creating, destroying potential units get killed or created during the gameplay. Um, the tree data allows you to store things like your strategic data, your targeting data. So every time you have to go and make a calculation that says, what available moves does my awesome warrior over here have available? Right? There's a calculation involved in And maybe a small calculation, right? He can move three spaces away. And there's just, you know, milliseconds to calculate how many spaces he has to move. But if you don't store that somewhere in an effective way, you have to recalculate it thousands upon thousands of times, it suddenly adds it to a lot of processing time. So the tree pattern is nice because you can kind of do it in that further future thing where it literally looks like that, if you were to mentally project it, that back to the future slide, where you see the little branches and the arcs. And what you do is for each of those permutation orders, you get to the part where you left off, and instead of recalculating the entire timeline before, you just say, all right, start with this timeline that we're seeing, and try to get it to use it. That will save the time for us. All right, number four. And this is the one I think speaks to your question earlier, which is you don't want to be perfect. This is key. <laughs> when you make AI, you kind of have this weird God complex that goes on where you're like, yes, better, faster, meaner, stronger, right? And <laughs> this is the hard lesson I've learned. There's a, there's a part where it becomes 
counterintuitive to create better on AI. Even if you can make it better and stronger and deadlier, it's not necessarily a better player experience. You want to focus your time on what is fun for the player. And fun, doesn't, fun in many cases means flawed. It doesn't mean perfect. So you want to be fast and test only what matters. Um, some, some other examples of ways I optimize would be things like, okay, so for, when I calculate that further, further, further future, the opponent simulation, I only calculate the targeting data for you and your I don't do the spells. There's no, there's no reason to. Yes, if I did that, the AI would be that much smarter and wiser about what's to come and what it could possibly do to screw the player over, but it doesn't need to. It's going to be effective with just this baseline stuff. And then for the opponent's spells, I just assume, well, the AI probably thinks it's going to play a card. I just give it a card and say, it's going to play this one card. It assumes the same spell every time. And that, that makes it very effective without being perfect or accurate. So it's not accurate, it's not doing the best optimization or simulation you do, but it's good enough that the player perceives it as smoke and mirrors, as I said, <laughs> and to them it's a challenge, and they're mystified by how it does what it does. But at the end of it, so this, this whole thing is just smoke and mirrors. It's pieces of little tiny things like this all built together in a bunch of little complex processes, and that's what makes the experience of something like a StarCraft or a Hearthstone seem intelligent and challenging. It's just an illusion. Just an illusion. All right, so some fun facts about the game I'm building to share the AI story. So first off, I didn't say too much about the game I'm actually building. It's called uh, Prophecies. Um, so this is a tactical fantasy CCG adventure in three minutes. So imagine playing a game of chess and a game of Hearthstone, but instead of having to take 10 to 15 minutes to play, it takes three minute sessions. So you can play it while you're in line, have a battle, have fun, kill people, and go back to your day. And that's the idea. Um, coming to mobile in August 2017. All right, some fun facts. So I use a total of 21 unique choice sorting parameters. So we talked earlier about the number of different things you can use to sort of sort your AI zombie to make it smarter. Uh, I'll give a few examples of those. One of them was the gang up property, how, like attack party, how many possible units you can, you can um, attack with a group. So that's one score I use. Another one is the position conflict. I have another one I use called risk factor. So the AI will look at where the opponent could possibly attack and assess the value based on those positions as to which possible spaces might be extremely threatening to it. And then it will choose to move to spaces that are not so threatening, safer spaces. 21 different properties I use to sort the AI in this game. Um, there are no random choices. So this is another thing you can do in games. Um, randomness actually is a really cool way to read intelligence out of AI. Uh, the first game I did relied heavily on random, particularly because it was dice driven mechanics, so it had to have random in it. Um, but what's cool about random is that you'll see the AI do unpredictable things. Uh, for this game, I wanted to focus more hardcore experience, have someone that could reliably test, and make sure that the AI was doing moves I deemed to be smart and aligned with what the goals of the cards and the combinations were. So I, I decided against random choices. So if you were to give the AI the same set of stuff, um, it would do the same choices every time. But the chances of encountering that, of course, are almost negligible. There are only 1,100 lines of code spread out over nine classes that drive the entire AI in this game. That's how small it is. Uh, I think my original set was probably over 5K and it was a giant spiral mess. I honestly couldn't tell you the real number because, as I mentioned, it was like spread across every unique ability, had like code lingering in it. It was incredibly spaghetti, very bad. This is very isolated, very specific group classes, all of them have a specific job, very small code base involved to it. Um, the AI, as I had mentioned that first goal, it can immediately use any new card I throw in. So the cards are created on a definitions editor where you can program logic and basically like a text editor file. Which is really cool because you can take that text file, upload it to a server manifest, and you can give your players real-time updates on an iOS or Android mobile device without having to have them go through the App Store download policy. The AI will take that information, assimilate those new rules, and immediately use effective strategies as if they were based on principles I said earlier, which is it does that by going back in time and determining its possible futures. That's, that's all it is. That's what it is. So um, that's all the content I have for the AI. Um, one more thing I like to bring up, I do this in all my speeches now, is the, the notion of the pay forward and sort of why I do these talks. Uh, I'm a person that has found success and believes in the notion of um, the term Joel Smith has gotten used now called co-opetition. 
the, the people we want closest are those we are directly competing with in this industry. I see extreme value in places like the IGBA where we bring together very diverse talent across different studios, sharing insights like this because it helps to make all of us better developers, and by all of us being better, better developers, we can make more awesome and gaming games and enrich the market space and create better entertainment. Um, this is part of a series I also attach to, um, I have a YouTube series I've started, it's called How to Start a Game Company. So if you're looking for other talks like this, other information, I've recently partnered with the University of Utah EE program. There's an awesome aspiring producer there, his name is Logan Erickson. Some of you may know him. He runs the Geek Wave radio show, and we've started doing some of these videos together now. Um, we talk on a number of different topics related to games. I would love to get other folks on the show, particularly in Utah, to showcase either the work you're doing or help answer questions you may have. Just want to throw it out there. Um, the URL is really weird because YouTube doesn't really have great URLs. The easiest way to find this channel as of right now is just to go to videos and search how to start a game company. We're the first hit. That's all I have. Thank you. Q&A, yeah, let's have it. Anyone have any questions? How many steps forward does uh, your game look? Uh, how many turns forward? Uh, three, or two and a half is a way to say it. It does two full turn simulations, and then it ends the turn to check and see if there's any lingering status effects that would be removed at the start of the next round. So it's the second turn. So it's turn, the opponent's turn, and then it comes back to the start of its next turn. Yes? Uh, somebody mentioned it before uh, with the StarCraft question. Uh, this methodology can be applied to Twitch games. So again, I, I can't speak from direct experience on the applicability of Twitch games. Um, my goal in sharing this is to kind of give a, um, a heuristic, a, a way of looking at the challenges involved in creating AI. Um, I'm, I'm sure that the philosophies and methodologies may apply, but you're going to be in a different ballpark of challenges because you're going to have to calculate things in real time. You're going to have to calculate things with competing priorities that shift on a much more conductive basis than a turn base where the AI has to change between resources and things like that. So, I can't speak personally with an honest answer as to how applicable they are, but my high-level guess would be that the basic principles or thought processes would at least be useful in arming you at the start of tactics. And the same goes for like a first-person shooter, if you're going to do that too. It's a similar kind of thing where you're dealing with Twitch principles, but it's a different kind of tactical. It's going to have its own challenges with it. Awesome questions. Any more can answer for you guys? Right. Fantastic. It's another wonderful day in Utah. <laughs>